lunch that I had uh, with some fellow pastors. So if you would bow your head with me tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can be here in your house tonight. God, we, we thank you, God, for all the blessings, God, all of the, um, <coughs> all the things, Lord, that you were able to speak to us through, Lord, and the word that we were able to have in our Bible studies all week. God, I pray for, I thank you for the conviction, Lord, that you laid upon our hearts for things. And Lord, I pray that we have grown in our faith since the last time we've been here. And Lord, may we continue to do so. God, we pray for those that are hurting and sick tonight, Lord, that would have loved nothing more to be in your house. Um, but God, I just pray, Lord, that you would just bless and touch each one that, that, that is in need of a, of a healing from you. Lord, I thank you for God for those that are here tonight, Lord, that are, that are maybe they're hurting a little bit. Maybe they're under weather, God, but they just uh, braved it and ended up coming tonight, Lord. I just pray, God, that you would speak to their heart, Lord, touch and heal them. God, we do pray for, uh, for Bill and Dot Vess, uh, Lord, at the retreat. I know they're not feeling well tonight, and God, I pray that you would, uh, Lord, just touch and touch their bodies, and uh, Father, just help all those nurses and, and uh, folks over there at that facility, help them and encourage them. Uh, God, I pray tonight, Lord, as we're in a portion of your word, God, I pray that we would, uh, Lord, be encouraged. God, I pray that we would be filled. Lord, I pray that you would empty us of self, empty us of sin, God, and Lord, fill us of your Holy Spirit, Father, that we may be an example, Lord, a lighthouse, God, that we may wear the, wear the badge or the name tag of Christian, Father, proudly this week, God, let us have our heads up high, Father, regardless what we're going through in our life, Lord, knowing that, that you are still on the throne tonight, Lord, knowing that you, you are victorious, Lord, and, and we are just, uh, we're just doing what you have called us to do, Father, just sharing our faith and, uh, and loving other people, Lord, Father, we pray for our children and our youth, God, that are, uh, that are here tonight, Lord, I pray that you would, uh, Lord, just speak to the, speak to their hearts, Lord, I pray that you would use all of our teachers tonight, God, to give them wisdom and instruction from the uh, from the uh, from the word of God and again we thank you Lord for uh, for your presence tonight God we thank you Lord that we can come and, and just worship you Lord we ask for your forgiveness for all things father in Jesus name amen amen so uh, so we had a great lunch today um, and the uh, we had a representative he's actually the executive director for South Carolina Baptist Convention and so he came to our uh, to our pastor's luncheon today and and spoke to us and um, and he began sharing numbers with us about our state, not about nationally, even though the national numbers are important. But he was breaking it down to statewide, to our region, to South Carolina, um, and and what we have and the importance of sharing the gospel. And so so if you if you look at our state and and I and I posted some of these numbers earlier today on my page on my Facebook page, but um, so there's roughly five million people in the state of. South Carolina, 5 million people. And a study was done out of those 5 million people, uh, or 5, it's 5.3 million people, and out of those, 80% do not go to any evangel evangelical church at all. In other words, no Christian church, 80% of our state does not attend church. And you can break that down to our county, to Cherokee County, over 70% of our county are unchurched. They do not go anywhere. So that means they're sitting at home tonight. They were sitting at home Sunday night or Sunday morning uh, and Sunday night. So the question is, what do we do about that? Uh, and uh, a guy named uh, Tony Wolf, he is, like I said, he's the executive director for the South Carolina Baptist Convention. And he was sharing with us um, the the desire or, or the, the plan of, of what we need to do to share the gospel, how, how we need to keep it in our hearts and how is it important and, uh, to share our faith with other people. Um, and he used Ecclesiastes chapter 4. So I know we've been in Ephesians now for a while, but we're going to be in Ecclesiastes tonight. So that's in your Old Testament. If you close your Bible and open it up right in the middle, you're either going to land in Psalms, Proverbs, or Ecclesiastes, okay? Uh, so go ahead and flip there, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 8. And one of the things, as you're turning there, I'll share this with you. <clears throat> one of the things that he was uh, mentioning to us about, and again, there were probably 15 or 20 pastors sitting in the room, and one of the things he was mentioning was the, uh, the, the struggle of even the, um, the funding for the South Carolina Baptist Convention. And I can say um, proudly, uh, as our church, we give to the cooperative program. We give a good amount to the cooperative program, and I'm sure there's always more that we can give, but we do support. Um, but their giving has gone down about 26% over the last year, and I know, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we could say that there's a lot of reasons behind that, and, um, and so we were kind of listening to all those numbers, and he shared this story with us, and, and I'll share it with you before we start tonight, 
um, that some of the things that, that happen, because there's a lot of folks today, even in Baptist churches, for one, they don't know why they're Baptist or they don't know why that come about or, or what they believe versus what other people believe. Uh, but, but even further, uh, a lot of people that sit in your Baptist churches today have no idea what the cooperative program is. And that's either the, you can go as an umbrella as far as the uh, Southern Baptist Convention, which is nationally. Um, and then you go to the South Carolina Baptist Convention, which is locally. And then under that umbrella is the Broad River Baptist Association. And that's the association we're in. And then go even further. And then that's White Plains Baptist Church. So we're all under those umbrellas of, of serving the Lord. But, um, but he was talking about in South Carolina and how we have uh, seminaries here in our state. And, um, and the funding that the South Carolina Baptist Convention gets, a lot of that funding goes to fund our seminaries, uh, our, our, uh, our Baptist seminaries. So <clears throat> as, he was, as he was talking about that, he shared this story about this girl. Uh, they, they call her Sarah. Obviously, that's not her real name because she is a, um, she is a missionary in third world countries. And, you know, you start giving out names and information that could, uh, could endanger them severely. It's not like here where you can openly share your faith. Um, you know, you go there, you, you have to have a different platform. And he was talking about this girl, and they call her Sarah, um, and she is 22 years old. And she went through uh, seminary not to be a pastor, but to, obviously, but, but, but to be uh, a missionary. And so she went through the seminary, again, that was funded by the South Carolina Baptist Convention. And they were getting a group of, of, of young people, 3,000 young people out of our state, uh, and asking them if they would be willing to go through a very in-depth, um, a very in-depth training to take them to some of the places in the world that no one has ever heard, no one has ever heard the gospel. Uh, and this young girl was one of the ones who willingly said, "I will go." Uh, and so they trained her and trained her. She, you know, she graduated seminary and they could, uh, she continued being trained. And they took her to Asia. They gave her a satellite phone and a backpack and some other supplies. And they dropped her off in Asia and told her to go uh, to some of these furthest places that she can get to to share the gospel. And they said she has uh, video and FaceTimed and Zoomed uh, in these crazy tribe areas where no one has ever heard the gospel. And she has been winning people to the Lord over and over and over again because she was willing to step out in faith and do that. Um, you know, some people, again, a lot of people in churches today, they don't understand the, the reasoning behind, uh, you know, your, your tithing and your giving. It does not stop here in this church. You know, some people think, well, this is, this is all that it goes for, the lights and, the, and all the... No, what we give, a portion of that, man, it goes all over our country. It goes all over the world. And when we give to support not only our church... We're supporting ladies like Sarah, this lady, and then other people across the world that is sharing the gospel uh, for people. So we need to be praying for those that have surrendered to the call of being missionaries and are serving, have leaving their families behind. And man, I was just so moved today when I heard that story. I was like, man, we, she had so many and has currently so many barriers against her when it comes to sharing her faith. There's the language barrier. She's, she's in an, un, uh, um, an uncomfortable environment. She's not around her friends and her family, but yet she's still every day telling people about Jesus. Um, you know, what, what barriers do we have today to share our faith with other people? Um, m most of the time, we have no barriers. There's not language barriers. Uh, we're, we're generally in, in a comfortable environment where we're close to home. Uh, so what is our barriers and, and what does it mean to share our faith with other people? I want to read this um, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting in verse 8, and we're going to go down to verse 12. So if you have your Bible, stand with me tonight uh, as we honor the reading of God's Word. So Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting in verse 8, the Bible says, There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet... Is there no end of all of his labor? Neither is his, eyes, is his eyes satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor? And bereave my soul for good. This is also vanity. Yea, it is sore travail, which means sore work. Then he says in verse 9, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall the one will lift, will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone, 
when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one uh, be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would bow your ear, if you would be seated tonight. So we're talking about better together. We are better together. You know, it, it seems, it wasn't too long ago I was talking about uh, friends. I think it was, what, Sunday morning, I think it was. Uh, I preached a sermon on, on being friends or friendship. Um, and then this passage uh, come to me today as well as we were sitting in that, that meeting today. Uh, and it seems as though maybe uh, as individuals or maybe as a church, we need to be reminded that we are better together. We can do more together than one person can do alone. Um, we can encourage one another. One of the one of the things that we were warned that we were warned about uh, the most in seminary was never put yourself out on a limb. When you alienate yourself from every type of help, you put yourself in some of the most vulnerable positions because there's no one there to help you. There's no one there to talk to you. And the same goes for us in our life. When you alienate yourself from everybody around you, you have no desire to talk to people. You have no desire to seek help. You have no desire to, to be encouraged or to be that one that is encouraging. Um, that one person, that one individual is alone. And when that person is alone or that individual is alone, man, they are a sitting target for Satan to come and attack, to throw darts at, to discourage, um, and, and, just, and just cause so much heartache. So, um, as we see the, excuse me, the writer of Ecclesiastes, he says, there is one alone. And, and I'm going to tell you this before we go any further. Um, I don't know if you have ever experienced it before. I, I can tell you tra in a transparent way that I 100% have before. I don't know if you've ever been uh, in a room full of people and felt like you were the only one there. Uh, if you felt so, uh, so discouraged or maybe just depressed, maybe anxiety, call it whatever you want to, <clears throat> and you feel like you're just absolutely alone, and you can be in a room full of 10 people or a room full of 100 people, and it seems like there's nobody there to help you. There's nobody there to talk to you. There's nobody there uh, to be a part of your life. You know, before we go any further, I want to tell you if, you know, if, if by chance tonight that's you and you're sitting here or maybe somebody watching uh, on, on our page later on, you know, I don't know, a week, a year later. When you accept Christ as your Savior, you are never alone. It uh, doesn't matter the situation that you're in. Um, you, if, if you feel like there's no help for you at all, man, that is Satan just pushing your heart and pushing your mind away from God. Uh, the Lord loves you. He wants to be a part of your life. Uh, his son died on a cross so that you may have joy and have peace in your life and in your heart. Um, so as it says in uh, chapter 4, verse 8, he says, There is one alone. Now when you're by yourself and you've never trusted in Christ, uh, you're living that life, you are alone. And you're in, that's, why, that's why it feels so weird. That's why it feels so empty. Because you, you're made to have that companionship with the Lord. Uh, but when you're living your life by yourself, there seems to be uh, that feeling of aloneness. So... First thing I want to look at tonight is that number one, one being alone. Uh, there is one alone, <coughs> and there is, <coughs> excuse me, there is one alone, and there is not a second. That's kind of discouraging, isn't it? That, that's not a very encouraging uh, passage. Is when you're alone, there's not a second. That's why we need Jesus tonight. That's why we desperately are in need of the Lord. We need that companionship. I was reading this week with me and Stacy and Lane. We were reading out of Luke 10 uh, when Jesus called the 72. You know, there's a reason why Jesus called them out two by two. So they would have companionship. There was a reason that the animals came to Adam and Eve, or came to Adam, uh, for him to name all of the animals that came all onto the ark and off of the ark. It's because companionship. Having someone there with you is absolutely critical in your life. So he says, there is one alone, and there is not a second. But here's the thoughts when there is one alone. He says, yea, he hath neither child nor brother Yet there is no end of all this labor. In other words, verse 8, he says, there's nobody there with him. 
There's nobody there with him. He has no child. He has no brother. In other words, he's saying, I have nobody to work for. I have no companionship in my life. And now tonight, you know, you may, uh, you may have, uh, you may go home tonight and it's only you in your house. But I, I want to tell you something with, with everything that's in me. Even if you go home to a house that has just you in it, you are still not alone. You look around, you look around in this room tonight, you've got, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 people in this room. But most importantly, you have a heavenly father that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, you're serving the Lord. You're being faithful. Uh, the Bible says that he is close. He is closer than a brother. So praise the Lord for that. But in this passage in verse 8, he's not so much talking about a person living their life alone, but he's talking about uh, having those brothers and sisters that is near him. Uh, he says, yet there is no end of all his labor. And he says, neither is his eye satisfied with riches. So in other words, he's working, he's thriving, he's doing everything that he can, but yet he is not satisfied with anything. He's worked himself to where there's nobody around him. Uh, he is more concerned, he's more satisfied, or he's not satisfied, rather, with all the work. Listen to this. He says, neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither saith he, for whom do I labor? Neither saith he, for whom do I labor? He says, I have no one. I have no one to labor with. I have no one there uh, in my life. And he says, and bereave my soul of good. This is also vanity. Uh, yea, it is a sore travail or a sore work. You see, when you have no companionship and you're working and you're working and you're working and there's no one to share it with, there's no one to be encouraged, there's no one there. And again, you may go home tonight and there may be nobody else in your house, but can I, I want to encourage you as much as I can, you being a part of, of, of White Plains Baptist Church, you are not alone at all, uh, but being a part of the kingdom of God, uh, even more so, you are not alone. So here he says in verse 9, and again, uh, when, when I heard this text today, when I, uh, when I heard some of this given to us by, by uh, Dr. Tony Wolf, he was referring to us as pastors having companionship at, a, at an associational level or, or, or pastors that are surrounding us in our heart. But I thought, man, how great is it to know as fellow believers in one church, uh, in one body, that we have companionship uh, for one another. He says in verse 9, he says, two are better than one. You say, you may know somebody tonight that, uh, that is part of that 70-something percent of Cherokee County that, that is not involved in church whatsoever. You may know somebody that's, uh, that, that's struggling in their life, that, that's, that's not, uh, they don't have that joy, they don't have that peace. Uh, man, do your best to get them inside the walls of this church. Do your best to encourage them to come be a part of the family of God. I never knew before I got saved how important church was. I never knew how important it was to come to a Wednesday night service and see people that are smiling and are like-minded and uh, that are just ready to be here to worship the Lord and be filled and be encouraged. Man, it helps me so much when I'm here uh, at church and having that companionship uh, together with other people. He says, two are better than one. Listen to this. Because they have a good reward. Why is it a good reward? Because you can share it. Man, one of the greatest things in the world is sharing something with other people. I remembered when I first got to the point where I was old enough, uh, Christmas started being a little bit different. I remember the first time I bought something uh, for my mom and dad for Christmas. Now, granted, I bought it with their money, but I still bought something for them for Christmas. I went out and I picked it out uh, and I brought it to them and that was special. But then that day, that, that day came when I got old enough where I could buy my own stuff. And man, I bought mom and dad a Christmas present. And man, it was Christmas morning and they were open. Or I was opening up my stuff. And man, I was sitting there and I was ready for them to open theirs. And I stopped everything that I was doing because I wanted to see their reaction. I wanted to see what they felt or what they thought whenever they opened that present up from their son. And from that point forward, I realized there was something. It was more special to give than it was to receive. It was more special to show somebody how much you love them, whether it's materialistic things or just loving them. It was so much better to give than it was to receive. You see, as it says in verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Man, they're able to help and encourage and to love 
and y'all tonight, we have something that we can give. Uh, and the greatest thing is we didn't do anything to deserve it to get it. Uh, but we still have it to give. We have the good news of Jesus Christ to give to people. And again, just in our county, 70-something, 70 70, I think it's 74% of people aren't in church right now. You say, Michael, well, who do, you, who do I give it to? Treat everybody like they're lost. Give it to everybody. Tell everybody. As we were reading in Luke 10, uh, Luke 10 this week, Jesus was praying. Jesus was praying not for people to be saved, but Jesus was praying for laborers. He says the, he says the, 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 the fields are ready. The fields are ready to be picked. The harvest is plentiful. I need somebody to go out into the field. That's what Jesus was praying for. He was praying for us to go out into the fields and tell people uh, about Jesus. So he says two are better than one because they have a good reward. They have a good reward for their labor. But then he says in verse 10, he says, for if they fall. You see, there's <laughs> verse 8 is talking about one. One person. Verse 9 is talking about two people. But what is that great reward? Uh, have you ever had to have a conversation with another individual? Maybe you were just broken. You were torn down. And you came to them. And you began talking to them about, uh, about all of your problems. And man, they just lifted you up. And they encouraged you. Man, they helped put you back on your feet. They, they, they just took the load off of your heart. You left after that conversation. And you were excited. You were happy. You were pleased with what was going on. You see, that's what we do. In verse 10, he says, For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But here's, here's where we fail as, as people sometimes. We see somebody fall. And just like the story of the Good Samaritan. We see somebody fall, and we say, somebody else will pick them up. I'm going to keep walking. Somebody else will pick them up. And then there's no telling how long that person stays down. Because we didn't take the initiative or the time to say, I need to help them up. I need to be the one to encourage them. I need to be the one to say, what can I do for you? How can I help you? Can I pray for you? What's going on in your life? To, to stop and help someone means so much, uh, means so much to other people. Let me ask you this. Have you ever in your house, I know I ask you a lot of questions sometimes, but living in your house, have you ever seen something in the floor and you left it there just to see how long it'll take for somebody else to pick it up? Have you ever done that before? Just leave it there just to see, just to see how long it lasts, you know. Um, there... Um, we doing Facebook Live tonight? I don't matter. I'm gonna say it anyway. Uh, so there is a sock that has been in our garage, and I don't know how a sock got into the garage, but it's been sitting there in the floor. I have walked past that sock for a week, uh, and I refuse to pick it up. I just want to see how long it'll stay. It may be there till Christmas. I have no idea. I'm sure it came out of Lane's bag or something somehow or another, but it's still there even right now. Y'all go over to the house. You'll see a bomba sock laying in the garage. Sometimes you just let it sit there. But you know, how terrible is it to have that attitude when it comes to loving other people? We'll just see how long they stay down. I mean, we may not have that heart, but if we walk past it, that's our mentality. Somebody else will get it. Somebody else will clean it up. Somebody else will pick them up. You see, they, they may not have time for somebody else to come and pick them up. Because I'm going to tell you something. You may not know this tonight, but there are people... That are contemplating killing themselves every moment of every day. And that person, you may be walking past that person the last time in their life that they're waiting on somebody to love them. They're waiting on somebody to say, what can I do for you? Can I love you? Can I help you? What is it I can do for you? You see, when it says, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. You know, it's hard for us to claim to be Christians when we walk past people that are in desperate need of Jesus that are in desperate need of someone to, to come to them and to love them. He says, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. He says, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. You see, all of us in this room tonight, I, I, you know, you may, not, you may not feel it fully in your heart, but if you're here in this room tonight, I can promise you, you got somebody around you that'll lift you up. You may not even know them. 
but you got somebody in this room that'll lift you up, without a doubt. But there's some people that truly, truly, truly do not. They don't have anybody. There's nobody else. That's when Christians have to step up. You see, we think about being evangelists or missionaries or, or, or you know, going out sharing the gospel, and you say, well, Michael, I just, I can't share the gospel. I don't, I don't know how. I don't know how to, I don't have a message. I don't have this. I don't have that. Well, there, there's a way to fix that, by the way. All you have to do is read the Bible. It's there. Romans, you read the book of Romans, the Romans wrote, it'll tell you how to share people, share the gospel with people. But if you're a Christian tonight, you have the love of Christ in you. You just go to somebody, and you tell them that Jesus loves them. And Jesus died on a cross for them. Sometimes that's enough to radically change somebody's life. Radically change somebody's life. He says, woe to them, for he hath not another to help him. You want to change that number and have 74% of Cherokee County in church instead of out of church? We have to be the ones to step up. Nobody else is going to. I assure you, no one else is going to. And my prayer is, man, I'm, I'm going to tell you tonight. My prayer is that this church... And I've, we've already seen it. I mean, we've already seen, you know, just in the last two years, we've seen over 30 people be saved at this church. And that is God and God alone. But my prayer is that this church will be the saving grounds for Cherokee County. That people will see this place as somewhere they can come and hear the gospel. They can come and be loved on. They can come and be encouraged. They can come and share and just, just be absolutely transparent with everything in their life. And that we would be receptive unto them and they would be able to accept Christ as their Savior. He says, But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. He says again, If two lie together, then two have heat. But how can one be warm alone? Verse 12 it's often read in, in context of a, of a wedding. Did y'all have this read at your wedding, a three-fold cord, three cord and not, not quickly broken? So many people have this read, read at their wedding. And, and it's, it, 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 it's apply, it, it can apply to a wedding, of course. Um, but, but let me tell you, the book of Ecclesiastes is far from a wedding book. Uh, it is a lot of, of soul-searching and, and things that are going on. But look at the reward, just in verses, just in verses 9, 10, and 11, uh, and 12, 9 through 12. Look at the rewards you get. Um, in verse 9, you can share your reward because you have it with their labor. Uh, verse 10, when you fall, someone's there to pick you up. Verse 11, you have someone there to, to keep you warm and keep you encouraged. And in verse 12, he says, so one is, one is good, two is better, but man, three is great. He says in verse 12, if, but, excuse me, and if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. So in other words, one, one person is going to fall. If you have two, then that's going to be helpful. You know, if you have two, you feel a little bit better about being able to stand because you know somebody's there. But then he says at the end of verse 12, he says, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That's having God in the center of everything you do. If you have two friends, if you and you have a friend and God is in the middle of that relationship, man, that friendship will last. If you're married and you have your spouse and God is in the center, and when I say God is in the center, I'm not talking about you're going to church. I'm talking about you and your spouse have fully trusted and committed yourself to Jesus. You both have a intimate relationship with Christ that is not quickly broken. That is one that will withstand persecution. It'll withstand drama. It'll withstand problems. It'll withstand life. What comes to mind when you think about a threefold cord? To me, the first thing I thought about was the Trinity. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is a threefold cord. And it not, it, it not only will not quickly be broken, but it will never be broken. Because of who our Heavenly Father is tonight. You see, there is one that is alone. There is two that is better. But three, man, having Jesus in your life and having Jesus part of your life. You can't fall. Because your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You may have struggles. You may have a bad day. We've all had those. You may have a bad day. 
but no one, based on the word of God, no one can take your name out of the book of life. Nobody. Man, that's encouragement tonight. That's encouragement tonight. So I wanted to share that with you. If we want to make a dent, if we want to make a difference, now we're not all called to be missionaries. We talked about this not too long ago, about different gifts that we have in our life. Some are called to be missionaries, some are called to be pastors, some are called to, uh, to be Sunday school, Sunday school teachers, some are, some are called to just serve in the church in other ways. But we're all called to share the gospel. We're all called to be local missionaries in our life. So when we have an opportunity to share our faith with anybody and everybody we can, man, take that chance. And I, and I, I cannot stress to you enough... Um, with having friends and family that has taken their own life. That person you may see that is down, you may be the last person that will talk to them. Please talk to them. If God puts it on your heart to stop and talk, stop and talk. You may literally save their life if you're willing to do that. Okay? Let me pray for you tonight. We're going to have a time of prayer request uh, and then choir practice afterwards. Uh, if you would bow your head with me tonight, let's pray. Father, I do thank you, Lord Jesus, for the message that you have placed on our heart, God. I, I thank you, Lord, that, um, Father, that you remind us through just, uh, just amazing passages, Lord, how important it is to have that relationship with you. Father, I pray tonight, God, for, for each person in this room. Lord, I pray for their, um, for, for their personal relationship with you, God. I pray, Lord, that uh, they would not be able to walk out of this room, Lord, without accepting you as their Savior. Father, I, I thank you, God, for, uh, for, for the blessings that come from, uh, from your Son. God, I thank you, Lord, tonight that, uh, that we have that three-chord strand Father, with that relationship with you that's not easily broken. Lord, I pray tonight, uh, God, for that one that, that may be here. I don't know, that may be here tonight, Lord, and they're, they're truly struggling because they don't feel like they have anybody to lift them up. Lord, if somebody passes them, Lord, they're not even going to pay attention to them. God, I pray desperately tonight, Lord, that, that you would bind Satan in their life. Lord, I pray that you would lift them up, God, in, in, in a way that only you can. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would put it on people's hearts, Lord, that are, that are sitting close to them, Lord, just to tell them that, that God loves them and it's okay. Uh, Father, that we, that we rely upon you for all things. Lord, I pray, God, as, as we leave out of this building tonight, Lord, and we go home and go to work tomorrow or go to school or wherever it is, Lord, I pray that, uh, that you, would, you would give us the heart for lost people. And, Lord, I pray all the people that are in this room tonight, Lord, I pray that we would have a desire to go out of our way this week for the remainder of this week and be intentional about talking to one person about you. Be intentional about inviting one person to this church to let them hear about you. Lord, I pray, God, that our hearts, Lord, would change. Our desires about church would change. Our mentality about church would change. And God, this is not, uh, this is not a country club, Lord. This is not a building where we come and just give our money and have our way, Lord. But this is the saving grounds, Lord. This is the dwelling place of a heavenly Father. And Lord, I pray that we would have so much faith, Lord, to know, God, if we just have them, if we just have them here, God, that your Holy Spirit, God, would speak through the message and would impact their heart in such a way that they may be saved. God, I pray that that would be our mindset, Lord, for this church. Father, we know without a doubt you're capable of saving people. God, you saved us. And Lord, I pray that you would use us, Lord, as vessels this week to share the gospel with others. Father, we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen tonight. Well, uh, let's go into a time of prayer request. I do want to lift up.